My life, my terms. Well, tonight on Medically Speaking, we're going to be discussing the patient's voice at the end of life. Please join us. Welcome to Medically Speaking. I'm Dr. Katherine Benny, your host for the show. Now, this show is sponsored to you for your good health by your county medical society as well as your county medical foundation. Roll back to the 1960s when a patient was facing some very critical decisions that involved life sustaining treatments or even medical interventions. Many times they were in such a state that it was very difficult for them to make these decisions. And if the family were to become involved, it was an additional source of stress, uh, tensions, arguments, and what, what we now find is absolutely needless. So tonight we bring back our guest, Dr. Robert Fawcett, who talked to us about exercise several months ago. He is a retired family physician who has practiced for over 45 years in our community, and he has dealt with many of these life-ending situations. He also serves on the Healthy York Steering Committee. And joining him tonight is Crystal McWilliams, and she has a master's in social work, and she has been involved with Your Life, Your Wishes, and is an active member of their board. So without any further ado, I'd like to welcome both of you to our show. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, Dr. Fawcett, we have a new term that has arisen, advanced care planning. What is it? Advanced care planning just simply means that uh, a person thinks ahead about what the end of their life might look like and thinks about how they would like to handle the many stressors that come up during that time. I, uh, I often recount two separate uh, incidents in my uh, practice. I haven't been around since the 1960s, but I have since the early 1970s. And I've seen an evolution of the way people handle advanced care planning. One story that uh, um, sticks in my mind is that of a bad death. And it concerns a patient that had a chronic disease that uh, patients with this particular disease almost never last past their 50s. They uh, have multiple organ failure at the end of their lives. And I encountered one such patient uh, as I walked into the ICU one day where I was teaching some residents how to, how to care for patients. And my residents, this was a new patient to me, my residents were in the midst of um, defibrillating the patient, uh, shocking their heart in order to get a, a, a life-sustaining sustain, rhythm. And uh, they were doing this about every 15 minutes uh, because the patient would go into the life-compatible rhythm for a while, then have an arrhythmia, and they had to shock the patient again, then they would give the patient a drug to try to keep them in the life-sustaining life rhythm, and over and over again, and the drugs weren't working. The patient was at the end of his life because of this chronic disease. He had multi-system failure. And he was surrounded by his family, which was very appropriate at this time, uh, but uh, the family was arguing amongst themselves because there had been no advanced care planning at all. And that was uh, unfortunate in this situation because it was so easy to see and anticipate the end of this patient's life. So um, the family one of the main family members was convincing the others to wait for the miracle that was going to allow their relative 
uh, in the ICU there to get up and walk out of the hospital like Lazarus. And um, I uh, assessed uh, this argument and um, decided that the way to uh, convince them otherwise was to uh, uh, convince them that uh, we were on their side and we were waiting for the miracle too. But perhaps since the patient was wincing with every one of these shocks, the patient was demonstrating that it hurt, uh, that perhaps we could forego that and have the miracle happen without my residents shocking them. And of course, they went into the arrhythmia and after a period of time died. And um, the family was distraught. They didn't feel like we had listened to them adequately. They felt like uh, we had needlessly allowed their family member to die. Whereas if there had been advanced care planning, all of that distress could have been avoided. The other story I'd like to tell uh, is about uh, a uh, Korean War veteran who was my patient for many years. And he went over to Korea, came back with a much younger wife. And after being my patient for 10 to 15 years, began to develop early onset Alzheimer's disease. And so we knew that this was going to be a downhill course. His wife insisted on taking care of him at home, which she did an excellent job of. We met together. We um, anticipated his demise and talked together about it ahead of time and decided how it was going to be. And um, we agreed that uh, because he was my patient for a long time, she would call me at the end of his life when she thought death was imminent, which she did. And when I walked into the room there uh, with his wife and their son, they were both holding him in their arms as he succumbed to his Alzheimer's disease. It was the most beautiful death I've ever seen. Mm -hmm. I would like to uh, facilitate that sort of death for more of my patients and avoid the recriminations and distress that often surround a family member's death. Do you think, Dr. Fawcett, that this represents an evolution of our thinking? It seems to me that when I went to medical school many years ago, it was almost like a crusade to the end. You do everything you can for everybody until you finally ultimately have to give up. Well, I think it, it has been an evolution both ways. As medicine made many advances and we were able to uh, you know, intubate patients and keep them alive for longer and give them feeding tubes and perhaps keep them alive for longer. People argue about that. But um, as those things became possible, patients expected to be able to live longer. I think if you turn back the clock 100 years, nobody expected uh, a patient with a, a potentially terminal illness to ever leave the hospital to begin with. So. Crystal, in your experience, is advanced care planning something that is commonly done? From the start of when I entered into the social work profession and was working in acute hospital care, I have seen more aggressive measures to start having conversations. So I think for a very long time, we often have a saying that in the United States, we're a death-defying country. We don't think we're going to die. You know, we're gonna try to find ways to, to keep us alive. And, um, and I've noticed over, I would say probably the last 10 to 15 years, um, hospitals really have started to talk, make sure that we're communicating about advanced care planning. And some of that is because of some of the, the, the passages of regulations that hospitals have to abide by. Um, but I think overall, groups like Your Life, Your Wishes have sprung up and have really wanted to begin to help people have this conversation. We, we find in our culture, and I can speak for maybe a little bit here in York County, 
that there is this idea around if we talk about death, we're going to make it happen. We're going to hasten death. Mm -hmm. um, and so we're trying to help people understand that by planning, that by talking about it, um, you're, you really are giving your family, the person you've chosen as your decision maker, you're giving them a gift. You're giving them a gift because they need to know how you want to die. Mm -hmm. And if you don't talk about it, the struggle, the anxiety, the guilt weighs very heavily on that individual. And oftentimes those are the, those are the feelings and emotions that, that cause issues within, within family systems. Mm -hmm. Do you see any particular barriers stopping people from doing advanced care planning? I, th I do. I think some of the biggest barriers are um, community, as far as if you are associated with particular communities, what is your community's history with advanced care planning or with hospital systems? Um, I think that's been something we have really recognized is that there are different groups out there who um, don't want to have that discussion because maybe the history that they've had with health systems, they feel they have not always been treated fairly or correctly. I think that's sometime, uh, sometimes a barrier. I think time in general is a barrier. Um, I think people think expense is a barrier and all of these things are just in our mind. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about the cost of advanced care planning. We'll talk about some of the, the, the laws that have been passed to help physicians um, get paid to have these conversations. Um, but I think to the point, I think sometimes physicians and healthcare providers might be some of the biggest barriers because maybe they themselves aren't quite ready to give up on their patient and so therefore, they don't wanna ha start having those conversations for fear of giving up. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one of the things that I've seen so prevalent within my work in hospital care is the physicians don't want, they think they can fix it or they can make it better. And sometimes, um, you know, taking a step back and, and the physician seeing their own um, or the healthcare provider, I'm not picking on physicians, but healthcare providers sometimes need to see their own fear around having the conversation. Well, Dr. Fawcett, at what age do, do you begin talking to patients about advanced care planning? I think uh, as soon as you're an adult, you should start uh, talking uh, with uh, your physician and your family about advanced care planning because none of us are uh, immune to death. Uh, Crystal's half my age and she could go out and be hit by a car walking across the street uh, and it, it could be a, a problem. We also haven't uh, mentioned cost very much, although Crystal alluded to it, um, that uh, the cost of keeping somebody alive without any meaningful chance of life uh, recurring uh, is tremendous. Each day in the ICU costs thousands of dollars, uh, not to mention the medicines and the equipment and, and the physician's fees and so on. Uh, so uh, we should be aware of the cost that we're saddling our families with as well. And as Crystal alluded to, the mental fatigue and stress that it creates by keeping someone alive who has no hope for quality of life uh, only prolongs the agony. Correct. Uh, when we return, it's come time to take just a small break, we will discuss the process of advanced care planning, what you need to do to get everything in order. So please stay tuned. back to Medically Speaking. I'm Dr. Katherine Benny, and tonight I am joined by returning guest Dr. Robert Fawcett, who is a retired family physician, and also Crystal McWilliams, who has her master's degree in social work, and she is currently licensed in practicing. We are discussing advanced care planning. Your life, your terms, your wishes. 
Dr. Fawcett, we talked a little bit in the first part of the show how important advanced care planning is, not just for the individual who's going through all of these medical interventions, but also for their families in order to ease the tensions and the uh, strife that's involved with losing a loved one and the guilt feelings that sometimes result. And certainly as we get older, we think more about advanced care planning. Do the various insurance companies, such as Medicare, allow patients to talk to their doctors about this? Well, I'm not aware that um, insurance companies in general uh, allow for this, but they, uh, doctors are certainly free to talk to their patients at visits for other things about these sorts of issues. Medicare uh, does pay doctors for a specific visit to um, uh, go over advanced care planning and what uh, a patient's uh, wishes are. Mm -hmm. Crystal, if a patient wants to talk to someone else, are there other people that could assist them with this process? Absolutely. The, there are other health care providers that are trained um, to be able to have conversations with um, individuals who desire to get some clarification on some of the terminology that they may not understand within an advanced care planning uh, document. Uh, a, an attorney is a great example, um, nurses, um, as well as spiritual advisors. Um, oftentimes individuals may feel comfortable speaking to their spiritual advisor and, and having a better understanding of how you that looks. You mentioned lawyer, and when I hear the term lawyer, I think dollars. Sure. Is this going to be an expensive process? So in the state of Pennsylvania, the great part about advanced care planning is it is free. Um, you don't need an attorney to sign off or notarize your documents, but oftentimes for those individuals who um, go in to see their attorney to do their estate planning, advanced care planning is oftentimes part of that process. All right, well walk me through it. Where do I start? Sure. So I. I say we start with a conversation because that's the most important thing. We can, we can talk about the documents and we will talk about the documents, but I think this all starts out with having a conversation. And so I just, I wanna give you an example um, of why I do this work. So back in about the year 2000, my mother um, sat down with me and she said, Crystal, I want to let you know that I am donating my body to science when I die. I just completed all the, the paperwork for it. And she said, and um, your dad and I just did our living will. And I want to tell you about what I want. And she was very detailed about how she foresaw or how she desired to die at the end of her life. And she gave some examples of some family members that she saw that she said, I don't want you to do that to me. I don't want to be in that state. And so oftentimes when we tell people to start with a conversation, we really tell people to start to talk about their own values, their own value systems. What did they see that worked for them um, with other family members or what did they see that they didn't like that happened with other family members? And so that's what my mom my mom did, she, she talked about it. And she, then, as a result of that conversation, she talked to her doctor about it. And then she put it all down in writing and then gave me a copy, and gave my brothers a copy, and um, she made it fairly easy. And oftentimes, this is where we do see some problems rise up. And sometimes it's the kiddos that cause the problems. So it would have been very easy for me to look at my mom at that point in time and say, Mom, we're not going to talk about you dying because I'm not comfortable talking about it. We don't like to think about the death of someone that we love. So let's not talk about it. I'm not comfortable talking about it. Um, but my mom pushed through all of that. And fast forward to 2009, my mom, you no. Know, I'm sorry, it was 2011, my mother was diagnosed with Alzheimer's disease. And we watched the progression of this disease take my mother at every step of the way. She was so classic. 
in how she progressed through her Alzheimer's disease. And at the end of her life, you know, they pushed, she stopped eating. She couldn't eat any longer. And the, the facility wanted to talk about a feeding tube. Well, my mother was very clear on that. No feeding tubes. And so I had to be her advocate for that and say, no, we're not going to do that. But can you imagine those family members that don't have that knowledge and don't have that information? Mm -hmm. um, and so that's why we say this has to start with a conversation. You have to identify the person who will be your voice when you don't have one. Well, Dr. Fawcett, we keep talking about this conversation and you're making decisions on feeding tubes. What else is involved in the conversation? What points should we be considering? Well, I think the, the main uh, consideration is making sure that all of your family members know what your specific wishes are, as Crystal's mom did with her. Uh, there is a, uh, a document called the Conversation Starter Kit, which uh, will help you work through this conversation and cover the things that you need uh, to cover. There's uh, even a game. There's yes. even a board game called Hello that you can order online and sit down as a family and play a board game if you're a gaming family. Um, and I think, too, it's important for us to note that when we use the term family, it's the family that the individual identifies. So it could be a friend, it could be a relative, it could be their immediate biological or non-biological mm -hmm. um, people. So you get the game board online, but this other document where there, you get there this. There are other documents that uh, you can use too. Five Wishes covers some of the more uh, touchy-feely uh, issues. Do you want music to be playing at the end? What music do you want? Um, you know, how, how do you feel? And it, it covers the, the uh, uh, nitty-gritty about feeding tubes and uh, dialysis, et cetera, as well. And um, where do we get these documents? Online. If you, if you uh, just Google Five Wishes, it'll come up mm -hmm. and, and you can purchase these. Or, uh, at least in this community, many doctors have these in their offices and will be happy to supply them for you. Mm -hmm. I think uh, both hospital systems would be willing to supply them for you as well because they want you to have the advanced directives uh, covered as well. Mm -hmm. um, this is a, a more uh, generic kind of uh, term that says what you uh, want and what you don't want at the end of life. And this is what the uh, statute created uh, mm -hmm. when they created the statute in Pennsylvania to cover these issues. So um, you want to have your advance directive, your health care power of attorney, somebody that you have designated to make decisions for you uh, when you're not able to make decisions. If you're able to make decisions, none of this comes into play. You can say what you want and what you don't want, but at some point, that'll no longer be the case. And then you need a health care power of attorney, which uh, Crystal alluded to. You do not need a notary. You don't need uh, a lawyer visit. You don't need anything except that person that you designate being aware that they're your health care power of attorney. You fill out the form. You make sure your doctor has a copy of the form. You put a copy of the form in your travel documents that you take with you on trips so that if something, God forbid, should happen uh, to you on a trip, they know about it. And you take it to the hospital so that they have a copy of that on record. Mm -hmm. No lawyer involved. The thing that you do need a lawyer for is your last will and testament, your uh, financial power of attorney, and that uh, governs what happens to your assets mm -hmm. uh, if you're no longer able to make those decisions. And, and that need not be the same person as your health care power of attorney, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, you can designate that person, and that will have to be notarized. Now, these are very important documents. Uh, should I keep them in my safety deposit box? No. 
you don't want them in your safe deposit box. Well, your, your uh, financial power of attorney, there's no hurry about uh, uh, dissemination of your assets. So uh, that you can put in your safe deposit box. But um, the others you don't want there because uh, what happens if you have a cardiac arrest on uh, Friday evening and uh, Monday is a bank holiday and uh, they're in your safe deposit box, nobody will know what you want for three or four days. Mm -hmm. That's why the conversation, so everybody knows what you want, and the advanced directive form uh, are, are both essential pieces of this puzzle. What happens if, you know, you talked about the music that you're playing, so uh, originally I liked Frank Sinatra, but now I'm into the Rolling Stones and I want to change things. How excellent, binding is this? Excellent question. You can modify uh, those wishes at any time, and all you have to do is uh, fill out a new document and um, then make sure that your health care power of attorney knows that there is a new document mm -hmm. and that the anybody hospital. else you've given it to is also yeah. uh, aware of it, including the hospital and your physician. It can be a working document. Mm -hmm. You know, I think there are things that happen throughout the year that you go and look at COVID. Oh well, my goodness, well, how do I want to look at this differently? And typically I have, personally, I have the five wishes because I'm a little bit more kumbaya about the, that I like that a lot more, and so you'll see I'll have things added um, throughout Tell them the about years. Your, uh, thick and the liquids. thick and liquids. Yes. So my mother, because she wasn't able to um, to swallow very well, they decided mm. to put this thickener in her mm. in her drink, and she hated it. Hated it. Now I don't know. Those of us in healthcare, we've had the pleasure of experiencing a thickened liquid. I think at some point in time or seeing it, and my mother just hated it. And I told the facility, "Do not. You're not going to thicken her liquids anymore. What you're taking away a very big quality of life for her." Well, Crystal, she could get pneumonia. Okay, she could get pneumonia, and that's okay. We're advanced in our Alzheimer's, it's okay. And so I went back to my five wishes and I added, I dated it, you know, put my, my initials and said, I, if I have an end stage neurological disease, I do not want thickened liquids, very clearly. And I told my daughter that, I said, if you do it, I will haunt you, don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Fawcett, how strictly are your wishes followed? Do you, do you find that due to family objection, for example, that, or doctor's judgment that we don't follow them so closely? Um, I think doctors make every effort when these documents exist to follow the documents to the letter. The I'd problem like is that the documents don't always exist, and uh, people misunderstand uh, some of the things that they mean. For instance, uh, filling out your uh, final wishes here doesn't mean that nothing will be done for you. Um, if, if I have a heart attack and they, the EMTs come to my uh, door, even if I have a do not resuscitate order at the hospital, they'll still do their best to take care of me until they get to the hospital and discover this, uh, this item. Well, this is vital information. Bottom line is make your advanced care directive. It's in your family's best interest and in your best interest as well. Thank you both for all the good work you're doing in this area and for coming on our show tonight. This has been Medically Speaking, sponsored by York County Medical Society and York County Medical Foundation. I'm Dr. Katherine Benny, wishing you good health, happiness, and a great week. We'll see you soon.